Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, stop this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here, waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. Everybody in this context refers to us and our cats. You are free to feel however you want about Rand. He's a fictional character. Please don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Rand. So, Towers of Midnight, this is Everybody Hates Rand, your friendly neighborhood Wheel of Time podcast. I'm Emily Jushaw. And I'm Sally Gidger. We can keep this so short. Chapter one of three. Remember how Rand left, oh, uh, whatever that city is. Vanderabon. Er, in Eridumon. He just left, abandoned it for everyone to starve. Yeah. Leaderless chaos in the streets all the food has gone bad so everyone refugees pouring in no doubt disease will soon enter yeah this overcrowded city and rand just left but you guys it's fine now because he feels really bad about it yeah and that's all that's all that's required and because he's enlightened all of those very difficult problems problems that people in the real world face routinely are just voila solved it because he's jesus is the most infuriating chapter of any book i've ever read <laughs> it was pretty bad <laughs> um i was reading it like sally's gonna love this <laughs> <laughs> um go off queen <laughs> When I was transcribing the episode last week, for whatever reason, I was reminded um, of how important it is to uh, demonstrate your literary arguments through specific examples in the text. I think we made an offhand comment about how Ranch does not face any consequences of the war crimes that he commits. And so I would like to posit this as the perfect example in the text of my literary argument. Um, as Emily referenced, Rand, when he was at his darkest, but probably like about four and a half hours after New King Grendel's portraits is what it feels like, uh, decided he was just leaving, uh, Bandar Aban to, um, the horrors of war that have been foisted yeah, upon the city. eventual Shanshan invasion, God yeah. only knows. The event, and like all of the problems that Bandar Aban is facing are direct results of Rand's actions, the way that his wars have sort of rippled across the continent. Of course, there's also the threat of the Shanshan, which is not Rand's fault, but his response to it in large part has been pretty minor. Yeah, and everything he did in Eridomon directly made it worse. Yeah. So he makes everything worse. He doesn't succeed in finding like a council to lead everyone is in the streets starving like emily referenced illness is beginning to run rampant and rand is just like literally leaves being like not my problem he says that to someone basically and just fucks off as a refresher yeah he gives up and is just like i can't do anything everything is too difficult to solve here yeah so he leaves creating um a city full of refugees um, who are facing just like incredibly inhumane conse- uh, inhumane conditions. And he just leaves. And then he comes back and he apologizes. He does at least apologize, I guess, but it's like really condescending uh, to just walk through the streets and everyone is, wow, surprise, starving, sick, angry. Everyone's forming little street gangs because they don't know what else to do. And Rand is just like, this is my fault. And Min's like, no, it wasn't. Min? Min's like, no, baby. Delulu. Absolutely. (laughs) This was not your fault at all. I don't know what is worse. I mean, obviously this whole thing is in Min's point of view. And she worships the ground Rand walks on. And I don't know what is worse, that maybe she actually believes this. Yeah. 
and is like Rand absolutely has never done anything wrong in his life ever. Or if she is just condescendingly putting on a supportive girlfriend show for yeah. her boyfriend. Both are equally bad, I would say. Yeah, your job is to be like, to your partner, be like, yeah, do better. Now what can we do to fix it? Yeah, like, I'm glad you acknowledge that you made a mistake. How can I support you in, you know, moving forward? Mm -hmm. But she's just like, no, Rand, you did everything you could for these people. There's no way you could have done anything different. Remember that child you had Nynaeve torture? Not your fault at all. No big deal. And Rand's like, man, I couldn't do this without you. (laughs) Rand's, like, at his lowest which Rand's been at his lowest for like three books now. So Rand, when confronted with the horrors, TM is like, oh my God. And he just like sits down, he puts his head in his hands. He just can't take it, which is ridiculous. Yeah. I just like have absolutely no sympathy, obviously, because he's walking down the street full of refugees who are literally dying. And he's like, how can I make this about me? Yeah. Again. Rand, whatever. And if I'm being ultimately like having a a humanist approach to this whole thing, I acknowledge that it would be very difficult to see the consequences sure. of your actions in such visceral detail. And I acknowledge that Rand would be feeling a type of way about it now that he has feelings again. <laughs> but Rand has not earned back our sympathy, even if he has always had bins. So right. to watch this sort of breakdown of his is just like ludicrous yeah. to the readers, if not, even if not to men. Yeah. And men like drags him out of this deep hole that he baby Jessica like has fallen into and is like, but Rand, everything's going to be fine because I look around and I look at you and I see all these incredible visions of people fighting in the last battle and going on to do great things like, you know, the normal status markers that we accept as quote unquote great things mm-hmm. like becoming an Aes Sedai or saving a woman's life. <laughs> because for the record, nothing in your human life matters unless you go on to greatness. Yeah, of course. Glory. <sighs> but she's like, it's fine because... We're saving them now, and everyone's going to fight in the last battle, and you're going to lead them, and everyone loves you. Blah, 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 blah. And Rand's like, you're right, man. How could I do this without you? And she's like, well, you have a million advisors, so you'd probably be fine. And he's like, but none of them love me. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. He's like, you're so clear-headed. And I'm like, this woman is standing in front of you having full hallucinations. (laughs) Yeah, also, Emily is right. She is, like, full-blown delusional when it comes to Rand. It is ridiculous. Yeah, clear-headed? Absolutely not. You know who's been clear-headed about you, Rand? All the people who you have pushed away. Mm -hmm. Matt, Perrin, they pretty much knew what was going on with you. But you gotta have your yes-man girlfriend. Your yes-girlfriend. Yeah, your (laughs) yes-boobs. what she is walking set of boobs yep at this point in the series anyway yeah so rand is like min's so right this wasn't my fault um so i'm gonna just walk around (laughs) sort of in my weird condescending weird girl rand era and just be like you're now the captain of the guard random man i saw in the street and this guy is now leading the city because he was a merchant or whatever and it was just sort of like not necessarily arbitrarily assigning people to do things, but he's just like walking around, quote unquote, solving all the problems that he left in like an instant. And everyone is just accepting this. Everyone in the street is like, Min references them like looking at Rand in adoration or hope or like they see the light in him and something about him makes people feel better, which is so condescending and ridiculous because these are the exact people he left to starve and die. Mm hmm. Like, the whole, not the whole point, but what's going on in this chapter is that we're seeing the reversal or, like, you know, the loop around of Rand's Taviran effect on people. Um, In the last couple of books, he's been more or less only affecting things negatively. People have been dying, food has been spoiling, weather has been bad, blah, 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 blah. Now he goes places, the weather is good, magically the food 
is unspoiled, which yeah. I am willing to accept. Yeah, that that didn't bug me. That's fine. Yeah, that was like one of those weird little fate things. Yeah. But it, I think, as we have talked about before, is concerning when we see the Tavir in nature affect people, mm-hmm. whether it is in a, quote, good way or in a, quote, bad way, because it is so similar to mind control. Min herself draws the comparison to compulsion. Yeah. She's like, an outsider looking in would be like, whoa, he must be doing something to them. But nope, that's just Rand's aura. And I'm like, it's a creepy aura. And the fact that we're not recognizing that is extremely weird. Yeah. Like, Rand just magically making people step up. Mm-hmm. And he's not even necessarily solving the problems besides finding the food, you know? Yeah. Everything he's doing is um, promoting people to solve the problems on their own. He's like, I'll take this guy who was vaguely competent and who has been doing everything in his power to keep the city from bursting into flames, more yeah. or less. I'll just put him in charge arbitrarily, like you said. Because everyone who was supposed to be in charge left. And literally this random guy I see on the street, I'm going to make him in charge of people. And we're going to start organizing infrastructure. They're going to start organizing infrastructure. And all I have to do is stand here and influence them to do these things. Which um, is moderately insulting because the implication is that if they'd had the right attitude, the Domani would have been able to solve this problem on their own. Yes! Like, we're, we're blurring the lines between what is a magical effect and what people can do themselves by having Rand magically affect people. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not like Rand is empowering people to have super strength or magic yeah. abilities or anything like that. The only thing he's doing is <laughs> making them visualize success of the secret style. And yeah. now suddenly they were starving a minute ago, but now they have the capacity to organized to lead each other blah 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 yeah it's it is really troubling and so upsetting and narratively is just like wiping the slate clean for anything that Rand did to bandar aban without him having to deal with any actual consequences even just the people not liking him yeah because now the other thing about Rand magically influencing people is that they're no longer like hey, so you abandoned us, or yeah. you fucked up, or I need to confront you about this because that's part of my process, mm-hmm. or any other sort of, like, negative thing. Rand will, like, walk up to someone, they'll be like, oh, hey, it's the Dragon Reborn, you abandoned us. He's like, yeah, I'm sorry, but could you help me? And they're like, you're so right. I was born to serve you, yep. my lord, and forgiven. Everything you've ever done is forgiven. Yep. So it's like changing hearts and minds is actually an incredibly toxic thing. Yeah. In this case. Yeah, because it's just not earned. Like, Rand doesn't do anything for it. He just shows up and is like, sowie. Yeah, it's never satisfying when a main character um, puts no effort into doing something and something happens, you know, has a good effect anyway. Yeah. The only reason that works for things like Matt's luck powers is because Matt's luck powers affect him in bad ways also. Yeah, they're Even if it's just his, like, constant dread about something that's going to happen. Yeah, those also have, like, rules. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it is more of a, like, magic skill set than it is just of, like, a way of being. Yeah. So, fuck this chapter. Yeah, no consequences for Rand. That he has to face. He doesn't even have to be uncomfortable for more than 10 minutes about it. No. He just just waltzes in there with men, fixes everything, and is like, okay, get ready to march for the last battle. Bye. Bye. And everyone's like, great. Bastard man. Yeah. I hate him. Whatever. I'm happy for the people of Bandar Bon. Yeah, I'm happy more people aren't going to starve, but people have undoubtedly already starved. I know. And died. Yeah. Horribly because of what you did. Or what you didn't do. Yeah, your passivity. Ugh, God. Like, I just want in fantasy for powerful leaders to have to face the consequences of doing crimes against humanity. Yeah. Is that so much to ask? The world I live in doesn't have consequences. (laughs) Yeah. So I want to read about them. 
Yeah, if anyone envision a better world. <laughs> if anyone's gotten one of those stock bitch ass responses from one of their congressmen oh, that yeah. are just like, you don't deserve to have an opinion. What are you talking that's about? That's what Rand feels like. Yeah. You're just the you know The people I step on. You're the cutout person that I uh don't count. Yeah. Their opinion at all. Get back to work. Get back to work making capital. You're the worst. Okay. Another terrible chapter. Parley. 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 So we're getting ready to fight the White Cloaks. And then we don't. It's, it's, it's so, so annoying. Exci- I, know. It's, <laughs> I wanted to see those motherfuckers die. Neil at the beginning is like, can't wait to kill White Cloaks. He's like skipping down the path and Rin's parents like, it's a funny image, right? Yeah. Neil just like throwing flowers yeah. and Perrin's like, um, maybe don't celebrate bloodshed. And I'm like, that is so rich coming from you. Yeah. And Neil's Mr. Like, Revenge against Fail's captors. Someone literally is like, well, you were pretty bloodthirsty about Malden. And he's like, well, they needed killing. And someone else is like, the White Cloaks might need killing. Yeah. And he's like, well... No, I say different. I, I don't think so. As they're walking, Neald is like, okay, bad news. Grady and I have been having trouble traveling. And Perrin's like, that's weird. Like, you can channel other stuff, right? And they're like, yeah, like, no problem. But it's just, we can't open gateways. And it's, it's probably just nothing. When has it ever been nothing, you guys? They're like, we're probably just like still burnt out or some other weird thing. But don't worry about it. And Perrin's like, okay, I'm not going to worry about it. Even though like people being able to travel is a pretty vital thing in your battle strategy, I would say. But uh, I'm not Perrin. And this is Grindel's weird little dream dream spike. Dream spike. That's taking effect. Yeah, is them not being able to travel. That not, they don't know that yet. Um... The White Cloaks are all, like, lined up ready to just have this, you know, what's that word? Pitched battle. Pitched battle, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. I'm so, that's the one time I've gotten a military (laughs) term right. They're ready to just have a pitched battle. Perrin's like, in my forces, I have mostly refugees. Yeah. Which is strikingly similar to Masima's army of refugees, but these ones are good because they're good people, not ear amputating villains <laughs> i mean that is i mean we, do, we don't know that there are no ear amputating villains in parents there's, there's never there's been one jack the ripper in there <laughs> there always is there always is um <laughs> but like to the point they're just cannon fodder they don't have armor or anything like that parents like they'll be the first to die and i'm like so stop them fighting or equip them better yeah are you in charge or aren't you i mean you don't know so yeah god how are any of us supposed to know Perrin also does some or brandon sanderson does some pretty funny like linguistic gymnastics to Mm -hmm. avoid using the term cannon fodder (laughs) i can't remember what it was but it cracked me up (laughs) because cannons don't exist yet yeah innocence with blades yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) so edgy Anyway, Perrin's all standing there and is like still thinking about <laughs> hammers and axes. I could kill him. When he suddenly has this epiphany, he's like, oh my god. The difference between a hammer and an axe is that a hammer can be used to create and destroy. An axe can only be used to destroy. And I'm like, First of all, incorrect. <laughs> so incorrect. <laughs> Axes are tools, and if you need to cut down a tree to make a house, you've used the axe to make that house. You, oh my god. <laughs> it's like the first tool you get in Minecraft, the create video game, yeah. is an axe. Is an axe. So it is, first of all, Perrin's conclusion here is incorrect. It's just like a fundamentally incorrect metaphor. And also, he's had this epiphany yeah. six times before. Yeah, second of all, it's like we're living in Groundhog Day. Not Groundhog Day, 51st Dates or whatever, where he keeps forgetting everything that happened ah. the day before. And he's, it's, it truly, it, he's telling it to us like he's never said this before in his life. <laughs> it makes me feel delusional. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, am I being gaslit by this series? You are, yeah. I am. Brandon's trying to be like, parents never thought this yeah, before. Yeah, parents never thought, shh, he's not had this epiphany before because I need him to have this epiphany now. And I'm like, 
people can have multiple epiphanies about different topics. Yeah. But the fact that we are still relying on the hammer and axe of visual metaphor is <laughs> shocking to say the least. Shocking to say the least and like truly terrible writing. Mm. Like, I really hate using this term because it like we've said multiple times when you use something as a crutch, like crutches can be helpful because they help people move. But this one is just like the most taped together scaffolding on this narrative. Yeah, I mean, it's a crutch, but it's not helping. It's helping you move from bad plot point to bad (laughs) plot point. So it's like you're using a crutch to slide down a hill. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? It's so bad because there are so many other, like, thought processes Perrin could have had. Like, he could have looked back at his army of refugees and finally had the epiphany that he is in charge. Like, Mm -hmm. that's just the epiphany. It doesn't have to do with this fucking I can stop this from happening. I can stop this from happening. I don't want this to happen, so bam, I can stop it. No. End of epiphany. Or, yeah, or his epiphany could just be like, you know what? <laughs> I don't want innocent people to die. I'm fine with the white cloaks dying, but if it's going to take a bunch of refugees with swords mm-hmm. to die first, I'm not okay with that. I'm not comfortable with that, so I'm going to take a different course of action. But no, the hammer... It's let's never- Let's review. I don't think we've got this enough times. So let's review. Option one, axe. Option two, hammer. We're making a flow chart. Axe. There's only one place to go. Destruction. Hammer. Two diverging paths. <laughs> two. two roads diverged yeah. in a yellow wood. And I took the hammer because the hammer is <laughs> the only thing that can create something. Hammers can create or destroy. I feel like I'm in the SAT. I feel like I'm in one of those dreams where I'm taking the SAT. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's think of some other tools. Screwdriver. I, I Screwdrivers can yeah, only what if create. Perrin was confronted with a full <laughs> toolbox. What would that do to his mind? Would it be like I could stab someone with a screwdriver? Oh he my would god! Completely lose it. I could hit someone over the head with a wrench. <sighs> <laughs> so okay. Stupid. Perrin is like, gather all the channelers. They all come trotting up. Perrin's like, I want you to make a ton of explosions. Like, unleash the full force of your power. Not on the white cloaks, but on the ground in front of the white cloaks to spook them. And everyone's like, that's a terrible strategy because we were planning on using the element of surprise. And Perrin's like, yeah, but now they'll be afraid of us. And they'll think that we have more power that we're holding back because what idiot would unleash his full power? And I'm like, well, they have met you, Perrin, so they know you're an idiot. Yeah, poor Argonda or whoever, who's like a... Seventeen time guy. veteran is yeah, like parents, this is the dumbest idea. <laughs> parents so condescendingly is like he's just an axe, and axes are fine, but he's clearly never had any other thought in his life. Parent has also devised a new taxonomy system yeah. for the world. <laughs> axe hammer. Are you <laughs> axe hammer? Yeah. Are you an axe or a hammer? Argonda probably has kids, you know. Yeah. Like he's got a full life. Probably, for what we know. I mean, he probably doesn't because Robert Jordan wouldn't have come up with one for him because he hates his side characters, but whatever. (sighs) So Perrin's like, let's go request another parley or like, or he has like Grady amplify his voice. So he'd be like, hey, I want to try another parley. Please come talk to me. Parley. Parley. (laughs) (laughs) Just makes me laugh every time. (laughs) Um, Makes me think well, of Pirates like, of the Caribbean. Set up the tent and we're going to do it more formally. Like, I'm going to have all my people, all my advisors there. They're like, great. We flash over to Galad after hearing this announcement. He's like, yeah, we should probably go to this. And every- <laughs> Bornhold and Bayer, the anti parent League. League. I like, absolutely not. It's a trick. He's going to murder you. And Galad's like, I mean, he went to the last one and didn't murder anyone. And he didn't murder us just then, so... I'm pretty confident that we can not get murdered, not get murdered. But even if I am like, buddy, you're in charge after this. He's also like, Bornhold and Byer, you can come with me for some reason. He's like, I got to leave all my captains, you know, behind so that we're not leaderless. But I will take Bornhold and Byer because no small loss if they die. <laughs> yeah. Not his thought process, but it would be a bit funny. He's like, I could sacrifice. These two are expendable. Extremely expendable. Um, they, he goes to the tent, walks in, and is, sees, you know, Perrin, some Aes Sedai, 
um, and immediately spots Barrelane and has has what amounts to a total crisis. Yeah. He comes on the spot, basically. That's basically what happens. He's like, I've never seen a woman who's as beautiful as I am. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's kind of the vibe. So he just, like, can't handle it. Yeah. He's like, whoa, he swoons. Yeah. He faints. And Perrin's like, you good dog? Yeah. Can you sit down and talk to me? The lad's like, who's this pretty late glad he's like this is Barrelane, the first to mean you might have noticed her flag yeah that i have is been very visible in our camp and glad's like yeah i guess i knew that but i didn't know she was a great a hottie yeah and i'm like no one thinks like this no one has ever seen a person so beautiful that they stop doing things for a yeah man. i like i it's never happened to me at least, I will say. And I've seen some great A hotties, I think, in my time. Sure. We all have. Um, it also just comes off as especially weird because Glad has never expressed any type of sexual Fully attraction. Fully was like asexual Glad up yeah. until this point. So for them to just be like, it took truly the hottest woman apparently in all of time for glad to like experience any type of sexual attraction it just reads so weird it just comes off really strange it reads like barreling is some sort of corrupting force oh yeah that's that's exactly like, what it her is her tits just cause men to fall over because barreling unlike glad has had a active healthy sex life well maybe not healthy <laughs> has had an active <laughs> sex life up until this point you know we know that she's been attracted to people sure prior to this so it's not like she spots Galad and is like, my entire world has come crashing down. Although she does act a little silly about him in future chapters. But like, Galad is like, has never seen a woman before. He was like, supposedly into egg a while, ago, like in their early mm -hmm. days. But um, like, he's never talked about it in any sort of way. So no, yeah. it's weird. He never got glad be like egg is i'm lusting for egg. yeah it has been a very like pure almost childlike romance yeah. yeah so anyway now he's like god damn it it's the hottest he i think he refers to um oh no he's talking about perrin when he calls he calls perrin a creature <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty funny anyway perrin's like Okay, that was weird. So, you met Barrelane. This is Aleandra, the Queen of Gialdin, where you stand. Yeah. And Galad in his head is like, well, I'm sure there's a bunch of, like, would-be kings and queens running around. No one's really in charge. Yeah. So that doesn't mean anything. He's like, and here's Fail, uh, who is also very important. Like, she's a cousin to the... She's a cousin to the queen in Saldia. Um... And Galad's like, oh, I guess if we're, like, giving each other names, I'm Galad, blah, 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 blah. And Perrin's like, cool, nice to have a name and a face. Uh, and Berlin's like, oh, you mean the stepbrother to the Queen of Andor? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. Um, hope she's good. And Perrin's like, yeah, I think she's fine. Uh, anyway, Perrin's like, let's get to the root of the problem here. You have been told... Or rather, he's like, I killed a couple children of the light a few years ago. Yeah. And you guys are still out to get me for that. You wouldn't be stopping us otherwise, which I think is giving them too much credit. They would find any excuse to stop anyone because they're white cloaks. Yeah. Um, but Bornhold is like, actually, you also killed my daddy. And Perrin's like, sure didn't, bud. That yeah. was fully the Shanshin. So, sorry. Um, he was like, he seemed fine, even though he was gonna kill me. And, um, Bornhold is so mad. Gilad's like, you just confessed to murder. And Ibarra, Ibarra. It's all, Galad refers to him as Ibarra throughout this, which is funny. Perrin's like, yes, I killed them. I did not do murder because we were, like, in a fight. And they killed some of my friends. Galad's like, oh, what friends? And Perrin's like, wolves. And Galad's like... <laughs> and what if Perrin had just not said that? Yeah, Galad's like... I need you to stop saying yeah. odd shit. Like, I, the point, I guess, narratively is to be like parents embracing his wolf side, but like, there's a time and a place, and the legal court of law. Yeah, to be like, and I speak to wolves telepathically, so they count to me as human friends. 
is a little bizarre. <laughs> like, what if you were just like the people I was traveling with? Yeah. The friends I was traveling with. No, but they're just like so... Spe- yeah. You also could have just said the name Hopper and been like, nobody needs to know that's a wolf. I mean, someone would have been like, that sounds like a fucking horse name or something. But <laughs> Compared to be like, whatever. he's just a weird old guy, which <laughs> would also be true. Weird guy. Anyway. It's like, Perrin, pick a time to lie. Glad's the time like, to lie is now. Wolves aren't good friends to have. They're evil. And Perrin's like, wolves aren't evil. You're thinking of rats and... <laughs> birds or something of rats and ravens which as we all know are evil yeah notoriously on the side of the yeah wolves are aligned good so (laughs) stop worrying about it take out your field guide to evil animals and the lad says i don't accept the killing of wolves as something to exonerate you like people kill wolves that's and it's not the same as killing humans which is a fair point and the point on which this trial will hinge (laughs) and galad is right galad is right the legal counsel is correct on this one but perrin's like oh he does switch to perrin randomly in the middle here typo keeps going back and forth anyway perrin's like well what if i have a trial and galad's like that's a great idea except um you wouldn't accept punishment and perrin's like well, let's have a trial before we start talking about punishment. Um, and Glad's like, well, you, regardless, we can't find anyone to judge it fairly. And Perrin's like, Aleander's the queen of the land that you are trying to exercise justice on. Glad's like, yeah, but she also is your fealty. You, she's sworn fealty to you or whatever, so she's not fair. Um, nor is Berylaine, even though, of course, I would trust her. Yeah. And it's like my men wouldn't. My men wouldn't, though, because she's a hussy. Because <laughs> she's a dumb slut. <laughs> um, and so they're kind of like, well, we're at an impasse. But right as Galad is getting up to leave, who should walk in but more goss? Finally, the long-awaited reunion. Yeah. It is nice that they hug each other and are happy to see each other. Yeah, and it is finally nice to be like, this is more goss, everybody. This yeah. is not Magden. Yeah. Perrin's like, so Magden? And Glad's like, this isn't Magden. This is the fucking queen of Andor. And she's like, uh, point of order. I am no longer the queen. I have abdicated and will not be the queen. Which is a bad idea. Why would you let your 20-year-old child... Yeah, idiot. Elaine is not a good ruler. Yeah, and Glad's like, oh my god, is he holding you captive? And Morgas is like, no, it's fine. I don't love him, but he's not doing anything evil. And Perrin's like, this is great. Like, why don't we have her as the judge? She's a queen. She's sat in tr- on trial before. And Galad's like, yeah, I would accept that. And then he's like, I don't know if my men would, but they'll believe me if I say we can trust her. And I'm like, what about Barrel like, yeah. a minute ago? So you can conf- you can persuade your men sometimes, but not other times. Are you a good leader? Or what is you? the truth? Yeah. What's the truth, Galad? Um, and then he's like mom why don't i'm gonna take you back to the white cloak camp and she's like yeah i fucking love the white cloaks who raped and almost killed me yeah and glad's like it'll be fine because you're with me and she's like okay which no one would do yeah i would be like fuck your little terrorist friends i'm staying here like the trauma alone of just having to confront being in a white cloak centric place again would be horrifying no way but of course, no one has trauma in these books, so Morgoth is like, yeah, sure, and skips along. Um, parents like, she, and then she's like, Perrin, I'm not gonna, just because you've, you know, taken me in and then made me your servant. Yeah. She's like, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not gonna pull my punches, basically. And Perrin's like, that's fine. Oh, there was another funny thing that Galad says. He's like, I've seen my mom sit in judgment. She was fair. Harsh, but fair. Harsh isn't fair. Yeah. Harsh is unfair. Yeah. It means you are, when you can choose to exercise leniency, generally not doing that. Yeah. I love when people say it's harsh, but fair. And you're like, it's, then that's not fair. No. Bestie? (laughs) You can be harsh sometimes and lenient other times and maybe it all balances out to fair. But yeah, if it's skewing harsh, that's not fair. Colette, where'd you learn anything? Who anyway, taught you this? Perrin's like, I, give me three days to prepare. And they're like, great, we'll meet in three days to have a witch trial. 
I hate to use that phrase, but that is essentially... Yeah, it is an, like a literal, that's what the White Cloaks think they are doing, is putting a witch on trial. Yeah. And Perrin has to be like, I'm not a witch, I just talk to wolves. I just talk to wolves, which is not witchcraft. I promise it's a totally different thing. It's a totally, it's fine. And more to the point, only totally good and normal guys do it. Yeah. Duh. And I have the proof. Here's Elias, the only other guy I know. There is another guy, but, but like... he turned fully into a wolf. <laughs> so we're not going to bring him to the trial. It's just me and Elias, and I don't know what to tell you. We're both nice. We're both super normal. I've never done anything like go on a sort of murderous rampage when my wife got kidnapped. I never did anything like that. Yeah, the really frustrating thing about the parent going on trial subplot is that parent does deserve to be on trial. Yes! Just like 100%. almost every other character in this series who yeah. has done despicable crimes. Yeah. Tragically, the crimes Perrin has committed are not necessarily the ones he needs to be on trial for. More to the point, the White Cloaks are not the people who need to be prosecuting him. No, I think, like, The White Cloaks have not been wronged by Perrin. Yeah, like, I agree with Perrin finally stepping into his power as a leader, which I'm sure we will do, like, 900 more times before the book is over. Sorry, it's going to have to rehappen before it really happens. Um, I'm being like, I'm going to stop this, but also, like submitting yourself for trial by the white cloaks is an insane thing to do because they have absolutely no authority over you. Yeah, it is giving them authority. Yeah, like all you're doing is validating and legitimizing them. Like it's a ridiculous thing to do. Yeah, it would be one thing to be like, I will stand trial via the Gialdan injustice system or rather the Andor injustice system. Yeah, where the crime happened. Where the crime happened. And, you know, then maybe we get the same end result. But yeah, I'm not being tried by you. Yeah. It's just, it's just stupid. And for Morgaz to agree to it is also kind of nuts. Yeah, Morgaz, like, you're no longer queen. How do you have the authority? Yeah, and just, like, thinking through exactly what you're saying, like, this is a crime that happened on Andorin soil. So for her to just be like, it's totally fine to do this extrajudicial thing rather than packing him up for a lane to try. Yeah, she's like, okay, like, she should have been like, all right, we're going, if you're ready to submit to a trial, then we're all packing it up traveling to Camelin, yeah, where my daughter, the queen, will sort this out. Which at least would have been an interesting yeah. thing to have, you know, eventually at some point we know Perrin is going to have to meet with Elaine in order to sort out the whole Two Rivers quote-unquote rebellion. Yeah. So it would have been nice to just, like, jam all those plots together. And it would have been great for not having the fucking white cloaks do this. It also would have been a way if not a great way for like i don't know if the white cloaks are under the andoran umbrella via glad and elaine working together then that at least is something better Mm -hmm. than what they currently are yeah there's just a lot of different ways this could have gone anyway egg is in the white tower corresponding with various monarchs Hilariously, Darlin is like, yeah, Rand's pretty unhinged, but, you know, it is a last battle, so. I don't know. But I agree, he probably shouldn't break the seals. And only <laughs> Egg's like, the ball's on this guy. He just wrote this down. <laughs> Darlin doesn't care. Darlin has actively been in rebellion <laughs> yeah. against the Dragonborn. Darlin's like, like, I give a shit. Like, I give a fuck about that clown. I'll tell you whatever I want. Darlin's the best character. Uh, Darlin is the best character. Darlin also says the very reasonable thing of, I'm not bringing my entire army to the fields of yeah, Marilor. the Shanshan, have you heard of them? And Egg's like, you've got to. We'll just, I'll provide you gateways if you need to run back. And in her head, she's like, that probably won't be enough. And it's like, okay, so you're. So you're lying. So you're denying the truth. Okay, anyway. I love you, darling. I wish you I were my you, husband. Darlin. God, marry me. He's so husband coded. <laughs> he really is. God, he gets a wife and is like, who is like, yeah, he's husband coded. Yeah, that's my, that's the love of my life, yeah. darling. Um, Sylviana comes in and is like, hey, it's happening. And we're like, what's happening? Oh boy, it's another session of the Hall of the Tower. My, the most exciting thing that ever happens in. I love these the scenes. The subplots. Yeah, they're guaranteed a woman's gonna cry faint or throw up because (laughs) these women despite having literally gone through tests to make sure they can maintain their composure under pressure just can't help it (laughs) it is their wombs start you know pinballing pinballing around in their insides and then they're like god i have to swoon 
<laughs> because of how she's manipulated the law. You're so right that it is in the context of what we just saw Nynaeve go through, every reaction in Aes Sedai has given in this book is meaningless. I mean, listen, the Aes Sedai are all a bunch of traumatized freaks yeah. given just based on the two tests that they've had yeah. to go through. It actually makes a lot of sense that they'd be fainting, crying, and throwing, <laughs> throwing up, up every constantly. 30 seconds. But Robert Jordan's world, that's not what is They're happening. calm and serene. They, she serenely threw up and wept. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tybalt, stop biting me. I'm allowed to have my hand here. I'll stop touching you, I guess. So Egg goes into the tower, into the hall. They're having a meeting, at, like, with not with everyone convened. Egg's supporters have very pointedly been left out. Uh, but they're having a meeting that's like, can't. how are we going to prevent Egg from just being in charge of the entire last battle because of this dumb law that says that when we declare war, the Amarillin's in charge. They're like, obviously we're going to be at war. It's the last battle, but we don't want Egg to be in charge. Egg's like, yeah, I agree. I don't want to be in charge, but I don't want like to, I don't want to have, you know, we got to figure out how to word this well. Clearly manipulating them. Eventually she gets them to admit that like, Okay, the Hall's going to take care of the war prosecution while Egg gets to wrangle monarchs. They all vote on it. Egg's supporters enter at just the right moment. And only then does someone reveal, like, oh my gosh, the Dragon Reborn is a monarch. So she gets to wrangle the Dragon Reborn. And everyone's like, oh no. We've been manipulated again. again. It's almost like when Egg seems like she wants to do something, we should really... Take a break and let everyone think it through. Yeah, reconvene. But no, they're women, so they're stupid. You're right. Their wombs are wandering so fast all the time. No. Too fast, too furious. <sighs> Egg's like, glad we've settled that. Now I want to bring up a different matter, which is that we shouldn't be convening the hall and like not letting people know. That's how we got to the big schism in the first place. And you know, the power to pass laws when not everyone is present has only ever been used for bad things. Yep. Um, and everyone's like, wow, we don't like to think about that. And she's like, well, think about it. And now we have to like make new rules. Finally, everyone agrees to it, which is great. I'm glad they're making some progress on that front, I guess. Yeah, it is wild that the governing body can just like meet in secret. Yeah, Egg's like, okay, starting now, if someone, you know, on, in the hall has to, like, leave the tower, then someone has to, like, be able to be their sub. Yeah. Which is a totally normal thing. But whatever. Um, they leave. Sylveon's like, great job, Egg. Um, now what? Egg's like, can you send... Or maybe she actually sends them. She sends Nicola and another girl who's an accepted... She's like, go to the traveling grounds, go to Camelin. Elaine is going to give you a bunch of copies of Terrain Griel that we can use in to get to Teleron Riyadh. I'm going to start training you. Sylviana's like, um, I don't know if it was the best idea to tell Nicola Loudmouth. Yeah. Mrs. Can't Shut Up. Yeah. That, because they're going to be spreading it everywhere. And Egg's like, yeah, I want them to spread it everywhere so I can lay a, a trap, a clever ruse for Masana. So yeah, I was like, okay, don't put, you know, accepted in danger, please. And Egg's like, no, don't worry, they'll be fine. She's like, oh, also, could you find out, have you found out where Gawain is? She just thinks he's in Tarbalon somewhere. And Sylviana's like, oh, yeah, I actually found out he's in Camelin. So, and Egg's like, oh, okay, send him a letter to come back. She's like, I need him. I need him. And it's like, girl, no, you don't. She also says... I would just like to draw everyone's attention to this. That man will be the death of me. And he is. <laughs> so, just thought that was a fun little, you know. I hope Brandon Sanderson did that intentionally. Foreshadowing. Um, yeah. It's weird that Egg wants gay one back, is all I'm gonna say. Yeah. He, she, her life has not changed significantly in his absence. For the worse, certainly. No. Having him there won't be better. So it would have been great if he left and she just was like, oh, right. He was weird and not normal about me. So I'm going to carry on. 
But she's like, get him back here because I need him. And I'm like, for what? Yeah, to fight with? Does nope. that get you what are off? You doing? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, those are those three chapters. What would you say your mood is? I would say after that, I forgot to track it from last week. We said what? Resigned and mad yeah. last week. Yeah. Well, um, I am feeling mostly mad. Yeah. Mostly mad. Mad and confused. Yeah, I was just about to say the same. A little confused. Confused, not like, I understand what's going on in the plot. I just don't understand why these choices are being made about the plot. Yeah, like, again, the hammer. Yeah. Again. But mostly mad. Okay, we'll do mad and a little confused. And last week we were resigned and mm-hmm. a little mad, so. So that's my <laughs> Well, what a beautiful chart. I'm going to post a picture of it so you guys can finally see it. It's but a rainbow that's slowly it's... going to become more and more red. Yeah. I sense. Yeah. <laughs> We're really going to have purple. one instance of happy on the board the entire season. <laughs> the one moment we were happy was when Rand was weird in a funny way. <laughs> yeah. But now he's weird in an infuriating way. Yeah. So. In a not funny way. and a not fun way. Stupid. Well, uh, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks to Glenna McKenzie for our theme song. Thank you to our patrons on Patreon and our followers on social media. Yeah, we love you guys the most. Mm-hmm. Um... I think that's it. Do you have a sign off? I do. Um, I was in a training, a virtual training all day um, for the last two days and then half day today. And it's like a a regulation training. So like pretty intense. Like it's through this really well-known like consulting agency in the country. And our like, (laughs) it was virtual. So like it was cameras off, mics off was supposed to be like the vibe. We were told at the beginning, like, nobody wants to hear your background noise. Keep your mic off. <laughs> Yesterday. In the middle of <laughs> the middle of just the presenter talking, someone had their mic turned off. And just belched. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> just like it was unbelievable, like cartoonish. How many people were in this? Like 20 something. I know. And the like presenter didn't miss a beat. She was just like, yes, do you have a question? You've unmuted, you know, because if so, you could unmute to ask questions. Uh-huh. And nobody said anything. But I was like openly weeping. I was <laughs> laughing so hard. So I don't know how she kept such a straight face. Oh, my God. You guys. guys <laughs> turn off your mics. It was so funny. <laughs> uh, it, Frat boy S. I know it was a woman too, from oh the best God. I could tell. Yeah, so kind of impressive. Okay, everyone. Well, have a good week. <laughs> yeah. So why? It was so funny. Bye. <laughs>